Good morning, good afternoon. We are back to Charleston in between and our second session. As you know, the first session ran a little bit late due to technical glitches in starting, but I think we have ample time for the second half of our presentation. You know, one of the benefits of a session like this is not just, as Leah said, to bring us up to date on current issues, uh, which cannot wait until November, but it's also because we have a chance in this format to have an in-depth discussion uh, about topics that we can't possibly cover in this way in the Charleston Conference. So uh, that, that is a real boon. And I thank all of the participants and especially all the presenters for having agreed to do this. Now, Leah, am I able to uh, show my slides here? Yes, you should be, yeah. it looks like, okay. there you go. There we go, okay, thank you. So the topic of our second session today is exiting the tunnel. Reflections from savvy executives about what the bright light of post COVID offers us. I want to introduce the session by sharing with you that on July 3rd, The Economist magazine ran a headline called The Long Goodbye to COVID. When will it end, they ask. Just when you think the virus is beaten, a new variant comes storming back more infectious than the last one. And yet, as the number of vaccinations passes 3 billion, post-COVID post life uh, glimpses are emerging. Already two things are clear, that the last phase of the pandemic will be drawn out and painful, and that COVID-19 can leave us in a different world. That week, the Economist also published a normalcy index, which reflects both of those realities. It shows life is halfway back to pre-COVID norms. I don't know how they measure that, but that's the assertion. That index tracks how behavior has changed, continues to change because of the pandemic. It's split into three domains, the first one being transport and travel, the second recreation and entertainment, and the third is retailing and work. And it's in this third space that I think we're probably clustered today. I recommend that you go back and uh, look at this economist work. But meanwhile, today we are bringing you our own take on the long goodbye from several of our finest leaders and thinkers in the higher education, information and library communities. So here's our star-studded cast for today. We begin with Kevin Guthrie, president of Ithaca, Amy Brand, director of the MIT Press, Peter Brantley, online strategies UC Davis, Rob Manuel, president of Indianapolis University. And then in our second part, Mimi Coulter, deputy university librarian at Stanford, Nancy Kirkpatrick, CEO at OhioNet, and Jim O'Donnell, at the Arizona State University. Here's how the uh, flow of the program is going to proceed. I'm going to introduce each presenter individually and each one will have up to nine minutes to reflect on the long goodbye. We hope to have time for some chat questions after each speaker and discussion and chat time after the first four speakers as a cluster and then after the final three speakers. And after that, we will conclude the conference for the moment. Um, here are some questions you might think about as we proceed through this next hour and a half. What does a normal look like? Have there been genuine opportunities to effect change? Will we use them or will we go back to the way we were? Uh, what if this isn't the end? What are we most worried about? What are we most excited about? And how virtual will we all become? Uh, remember, if you have questions or comments, uh, please put them into the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. And we will try to address as many of those as we can. So on to our first presenter. Um, our first presenter is Kevin Guthrie. Thank you for agreeing to be first. 
Uh, Kevin was the founding president of JSTOR in 1995 and Ithaca in 2004. And Ithaca, as we know, includes JSTOR, Art Store, Portico, Reveal Digital, and Ithaca S plus R among its services. Kevin has a diverse professional background that includes things that may not be commonly known to you. He has experience as an NFL football player, a sports broadcaster, a producer, a founder of a software firm serving football teams, and a consultant for the Oscar-winning motion picture Rain Man in 1988. Prior to founding JSTOR, Kevin worked at the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. He serves on several nonprofit advisory committees and boards, including Princeton University's Keller Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation, Lyricists, and Educational Testing Services, ETC. So Kevin, thank you very much. I think, uh, are you muted? Could you unmute? No, I'm having a bigger problem because my screen won't share. Hold on one second. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see if I can do that. Well, I'm having a little bit of problems. So I'm gonna go ahead and present without my uh, slides and um, and we'll we'll see how that goes. Um, so first you you uh, Anne talked about the different services that we that we provide uh, uh, through Ithaca and and i'll 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 ask some of these questions with with that lens. Um, you know, back in February of 2020, um, we, 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 have, we heard about the fact that Duke Kunshan University was gonna shift to online and they had shifted online in China during January. So Cappy Hill and I, you know, scrambled and uh, flew down to Duke to, to, to write a case study on this, on this uh, phenomenal thing that was happening where people were going, you know, a college university was going online in just two weeks and, how incredible that was, and we were going to document it so that people here in, in uh, the United States could could learn about what that might be like. And and by the time uh, you know when we got on the plane, I remember there was a, a person who was wiping down the tables and everything, and we thought, oh god, this is extreme. Uh, and by the time we wrote the case, we we, we actually have the case study on the SNR site. Um, it was March thirteenth, twenty twenty, and we had we had already closed our offices. So, uh, so we, we thought we were seeing the future, and we were actually seeing the, the president, the present. Um, so overnight, we we all began doing our work in an exclusively remote online way. And one of the things that I'm I'm trying to 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 reflect, and and I think my comments being first, I'm going to try to keep it pretty simple, uh, uh, and and look at this from the standpoint. I mean. Uh, uh, and called us savvy executives. I'm not sure about that, but but just as leaders, I think we're all leaders in this environment. We're all managers in some form. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how those things look from a kind of management leadership perspective, but in a simple way. Um, so so what happened is we we changed instantly uh, to a new world where nothing is normal, um, and inertia has been interrupted. Um, and and when inertia is interrupted, everything is questioned. And so we've We've heard a lot about how COVID has revealed things that we didn't know about ourselves, our society, our systems, our, our organizations. And yes, as, as Anne pointed out, what is gonna be the new normal is, is, is one of the big questions. But I wanna reflect a little bit on, at least in terms of my own um, personal experience, uh, reflect on some of the things that have, have happened and what I think that means for how we might need to operate in the future. Um, so. When the, when the pandemic first hit, we closed the office. I think that what we felt as leaders in our organization was that staff safety was paramount. Like everything was about staff safety. Like we didn't require people to come to the office in large part because we didn't, people didn't feel comfortable. And so we, we initially had to kind of respond to that. And we, we, we sort of reached out to the, the staff and we actually established something we call our weekly all staff meetings on Fridays at 10 a.m. where everyone in the organization came on, on Zoom basically. And, and we, we met weekly and we've continued that the whole time. And, and kind of the paradox of this is that we have four offices around the country, um, two in New York, one in Princeton and one in Ann Arbor. And each has, has had its own culture, uh, you know, local culture. 
And we never really had a kind of an Ithaca wide culture. We just had these micro cultures. And so in a weird way, we've actually as an organization become closer together um, by being apart uh, because we've had this shared time every week where you know, we've dealt with, with issues that were really deeply emotional, deeply challenging, um, whether those have to do with um, you know, equity and racial unrest or that have to do with uh, just people's anxiety, public health issues, et cetera. Um, so, you know, I think, I think we, we, we learned from that there, there were positive aspects to people getting together in that way. Obviously, during this time, you know, there's been much more attention focused on equity of all kinds and from all perspectives. And I think that the other kind of unusual thing is that when, when people started working from home and they were engaging with people from home, uh, I feel like as a, as a leader in, in, in work, we were more in their lives. And so there was a positive and a negative to that, but the positive was that I think we saw more of people's lives and we, we, had to, we, we were more receptive or more empathetic uh, to initially how people were feeling. So there was a lot of flexibility that we pursued in terms of help, helping people to account for their other commitments. You know, the days were flexible. Um, people's, we were much more, I think, um, attuned to people's challenges in terms of, um, you know, anxiety, mental health, uh, having the time that they, they needed. Now, it's still been extremely, extremely challenging, but I think the perspective of that has changed. And, you know, when one of the things is that as you reach out to, in that level, the other thing that has happened is this, this notion of, on the one hand, we used to connect very closely geographically or in person at an office, and we, we lost that, um, but we could be more connected at a distance. And so that, that has had some of these positive impacts I'm talking about, but it also has created some challenges, right? And in, in that I think people can organize or they, they obviously uh, receive information in their own way from their own connections that are distant and they come to their own conclusions. And I think there's been in the, concept, in the context of that kind of a shifting of power or at least questioning you know, existing systems or existing modes of power. And so, you know, I think that's, um, you know, you have people starting asking questions they never would have asked before. Um, you know, when we start thinking about what's the new normal or are we gonna go back to the same? I would say unquestionably, we're not going back to the same. We're not going back to the way it was. Um, I mean, even think about, so in, in the course of our organization, we've done surveys of our staff and, you know, it's gradually shifted over the course of the pandemic in terms of the amount of time or the number of staff who want to choose to work from home permanently or only work um, in the office one or two days a week. And you know, even companies as large and, and powerful as Apple you know, have said to their employees, well, you're gonna come back at this time and the employees say, no, I don't think so. Um, and you know, just think uh, a year and a half ago, people saying, well, we're, we're just not gonna come to the office. We're not gonna do that. And I think you know, there's a recognition that um, a, that things are different, but also that at least insofar as this time, when things are, are uncertain and it's somewhat shaky, that the existing sort of inertia or, or structures don't really hold. I mean, for me, it feels a bit like when I'm on my iPhone and I want to move my apps around, I hold the button down for a while and the apps all start shaking. Um, that's kind of how it feels. We're, we're trying to kind of get restabilized and we're not, we're not restabilized. And, you know, that's how, you know, I think that there is a very different, I think the best leaders or the best managers or the best cultures and the best organizations are going to be different in the way they handle these types of issues um, uh, going forward. Um, the, the, the next thing I would say is that um, there's been a kind of response on our part that's been organizational. Um, we, we worked, um, when the pandemic happened, it's kind of a similar parallel structure. Like, uh, you know, we looked at the fact that 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 institutions were were challenged. Um, they had to go online instantly. People couldn't get access to books in the library. We needed to make as much online access as possible. Obviously, JSTOR had a, a huge number of, of of journal articles, content, book chapters, primary source materials of all kinds. We, we saw that as being essential. And so we just moved right away to offer free access to that, to expand the access to those institutions so that they could get as much as they could to do their jobs. Then that we also knew that the budgets were challenged and the situation was, was, was difficult. So 
we moved quickly to offer this expanded access to where and if an institution had you know, licensed or had access to any JSTOR collections, they would get access to all of them. So we originally said, okay, we're gonna do that through June 30, 2020. And then you know, it, it, the pandemic wasn't ending and these things weren't ending quickly. So we extended to December 31, 2020. And then again to June 30, 2020, as, as the challenges persisted. And during that time, um, you know, uh, there have been more than 60 million accesses to those free collections that were made available through that program. And, you know, we, we saw that that was, you know, that's mission centric for us. I mean, trying to provide the maximum amount of access to our content is mission centric. And we found, we were thinking about how COVID reveals things, we were actually able to provide that access. We were, we were figuring out ways to be able to do that. Um, and so we started to ask ourselves the question, well, wait a minute, well, if we can do this, how should we, what should we do going forward? Maybe, maybe the structure that we have for how we provide access isn't, isn't right. And maybe we need to engage in this differently. You know, it's sort of like, well, we're providing this access now, then we should. And we should uh, figure out as a, you know, in terms of our not-for-profit mission, how do we continue that? Or how do we figure out a way to continue that? And that's not a simple problem to solve actually, because to a certain degree, um, we all are, you know, I, I use a harsh term, we're all held hostage to these old structures we have in place that are comfortable or they're, they work um, and they, they're, they're, they're operating with a certain amount of momentum, like I said. Uh, but we decided to extend the expanded access through, through next June, 2022. Um, and the reason being that we wanted the time to actually conduct a complete assessment of how we actually license um, our resources and fee structures in our business model, which hasn't changed really uh, since, since 1995, um, and say, well, how do we maximize access to the content um, and still you know, sustain the enterprise and still be able to grow and still be able to do the great things we're doing, but really go back and ask ourselves the question, not just assume the normal is gonna return, but, but, but really fundamentally ask the question, what's the right way to do this? Now that's, that's gonna be complicated, as I said, because I think we all are, to a certain degree held hostage by you know, things that have gone on and the structures that we live by. So that's, that's the work that we're gonna be doing over the next year. And I think, I think these two examples um, demonstrate you know, that, you know, what the implications are for, for where we are. And again, I, I don't believe it's, it's gonna be possible for us to go back to the way the world was before. Um, you know, this sort of inertia or existing momentum or of existing structures have been undone. And the way that things have been done, that, that sort of inertia no longer rules. And I think with the, with the upsetting of those traditional structures, power shifts, people ask questions they wouldn't have asked before. People have demands that they didn't have before. And, they're, and, and I think in, in today's world, we see, hey, those are justified. You know, systems that are pressed that have been in place for, for a long, long, long time need to be questioned, need to be undone. And I think that forces us all as managers and leaders, as people to ask ourselves really difficult questions. And I think we're gonna be held to, you know, to a higher standard going forward. Uh, in fact, in many ways, I hope we, we will. Um, and I think that forces us all to operate with a certain level of transparency and accountability. Um, and if I had to summarize uh, this in one way, as I sort of conclude what, what I think it looks like for leaders going forward um, is, is fundamentally, I think we just all have to have convincing answer always to the question, why? Um, why are we doing what we're doing? Um, why, is it, why is it valuable? Why does it add value? I think, um, why, is it the, why is the approach that we're taking the one that's best for, in our case, for our mission? Um, but you know, in, in every, whether you're at a library or a publisher or an aggregator or, or, or college or university or you're a faculty member, you know, why am I doing it this way? Is there a better way to do it? And I think, that's, I think that for me is the implication of what we've just gone through. Uh, and I think that, you know, I think we can all be, be the better for it uh, in, that, in that process. So I'll, I'll conclude there and, and turn it back to you, Anne, to open it up for, for chat discussion. Um, yeah, Kevin, I do have a question for you here. Uh, were any of your initiatives or uh, plans delayed as a result of the pandemic, put on pause, uh, stopped dead in your tracks, um, or were you able to proceed with everything you'd planned? 
No, yes, lots of things. Well, uh, you know, I think I think we were able to proceed with sort of um, a new approach to the work that we were doing, right? So the work that was already in place. But there was there was one initiative, for example, that we had um, that we were very excited about that we were in, investing in, and it was very much a new thing that who knows where it would have gone. But we were really looking at the issues around big data and and the challenges around big data um, and how from from our perspective when you look at the the future um it's going to be very difficult for um you know the majority if not the super majority of college and universities to get access to large data sets and so you know right now you're already seeing these kind of um uh agreements being made between a stanford and a google or a princeton and a google or whatever to get access to these large data sets to do certain kinds of research and do certain kinds of study and it's harder uh, there has been some progress since we were working on this, but harder for, you know, regular college and universities, faculty at those places, students at those places to get access uh, to these data sets. And, you know, the point being that, you know, in the future, you need to have this kind of data literacy, you need to understand these data. And I think, you know, in the earlier sessions, the discussions of privacy are incredibly important um, at, you know, at the same time, the nature of the work to understand the data is going to be incredibly important. And if you know, college students, faculty members at different kinds of colleges can't get access to those types of data sets, they won't be able to do that kind of learning. And to some degree, what we're seeing, you know, I would argue that in some respects, big data sets, you know, start to look like big library collections. You know, if you look forward, uh, scholars are gonna gather around big data sets the way they used to gather around big library collections. And, um, you know, what that, what that means is that, you know, it'll be a democratizing effect to make those data sets available to large numbers of, 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 you know, researchers, students, et cetera. So we were working on that initiative and we kind of just put the whole thing on pause um, given the challenges that we had and hopefully we'll be able to come back to it. And, you know, it's obviously that, that area is evolving at a very, very rapid pace and, and it may be too big for a little place like Ithaca, but, um, but it's a, I think it continues to be a really important issue. Um, there's another interesting question here, uh, which Rob Manuel might want to take up later, but uh, see what you make of it. Uh, the Emory University president insisted on a return to campus, claiming the need for community in a residential campus. So are we looking at inequities in the future where some workers can and others cannot telecommute, telecommute and I know this is true in other places of work and other campuses as well. How, how are you going to deal with that with your scattered locations and staff? Yeah, I think this is a really great question. I think, I think the first thing that we're trying to do, and I think we'll be held accountable to do, all of us as managers, is to be employee-centric about this question, right? And um, I think when I, when I talk earlier about asking why, like, why do people really need to come in? And are, are they coming in uh, to really engage in activity that adds that value? I mean, these are questions that you know, apply obviously to online learning and, and other things. What, which part of the work is really requires us to be there and engage with each other and which part of the work does not? Um, I, I think that in the beginning, you know, people will all, um, we, we, will, we will defer to the staff, like what can they do? And then we're gonna have to try to work for ways to make that engagement as positive as possible for people that are working remotely, right? And and that and have that engagement be be positive. I think we'll be better at that for what we've been through, but it won't be perfect. And I think that's really the question um, that no matter what we do uh, with the technologies of virtual access, et cetera, uh, I think it will always be challenging if some people are going into the office and some people are not, or some people are engaged. So I think we'll just have to be really sensitive to that. I mean. If, if, you know, uh, uh, half the team is in the office and then, you know, they have a meeting and everybody's on and it works out well, we've got good technology to support it and all that goes great, that's fine. Then they walk out the office and three of them go off to lunch together. They, the people who are at home aren't going to be engaged in that part. So I think there's, there are going to be things that we're just going to have to be very not, uh, uh, sensitive to and aware of as we go through, you know, this next process. And I hope and I think, you know, that people will be more sensitive to those issues. I know that, you know, I have a completely different view of, of, of remote work 
and how you need to work with people that are working remotely than I had before all this happened. So I, I think we'll be able to make progress on closing those equity gaps for people. Uh, and I know the point is that you know some people won't won't be able to work from home. We'll have to come to the office and vice versa. Uh, but I think that that we're going to have a much higher sensitivity to that. And I think that's where leaders need to be held accountable for for being employee centric. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. Um, we have another question along those lines, but I'm I'm going to save it. I'm not going to forget it, and we'll move on for the moment. Uh, I will introduce Amy Brand. Uh, Amy Brand is a director and publisher of the MIT Press which is well known for its publications in emerging fields of scholarship and its pioneering use of technology. She received her doctorate in cognitive science from MIT and has held a number of positions in scholarly communications, publishing and information access at MIT, digital science and Harvard University before returning to the MIT press as director and publisher. Uh, Amy co-founded the Knowledge Futures Group, uh, and she currently serves on the boards of several organizations, including Crossref, Creative Commons, the Royal Society of Chemistry, and the Board on Research Data and Information of the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. Under Amy's leadership, the MIT Press has been doing some very interesting and innovative things. So Amy, it's your turn. Thanks uh, so much, Anne, and it, it's really great to see everyone. Uh, I, I appreciate these nine minutes to reflect on what I, I think of as emerging from our liminal state into a post-COVID light. And, and Kevin, so much of what you said really resonates. I'll try not to be repetitive because I think about things in a very similar way. So I'll, I'll scan the future of workplace, new business models, knowledge infrastructure, and fairer research assessment, because those are the things that I'm thinking about right now uh, in terms of MIT Press's strategic planning going forward. Um, and, and what I hope is you know, a model for other scholarly publishers. But let's also acknowledge that the plot here is still very much uh, developing and twisting. So I, I wanna start with something that happened just before lockdown. Um, in late February of 2020, I was delivering the opening keynote at the first NISO Plus conference. And uh, on the flight home from Baltimore, on, I didn't know that at the time, but it was going to be my last plane ride for 16 or so months. Um, I was seated next to a scholarly publishing pundit who I won't name. Uh, and following my talk, he had blogged that my keynote was overly kumbaya, which was uh, his, his word for too much about OA and community infrastructure. And so I, I find myself boxed in right next to him on this plane and I'm unsure of what to say. And you know, out of the blue, he hands me alcohol wipes to clean off my armrests and tray table and explains that this, this COVID thing could get very bad indeed. And so you know, we launched into a friendly conversation about the coronavirus and about our concerns for our kids and, and our professions. And so really the, the lesson being is, as Kevin emphasized too, crisis brings people together you know, the capital insurrection aside. So, you know, we've seen this throughout the pandemic in, in our work in our personal lives and the increasingly blurred line um, between the two, you know, teams everywhere pulled together heroically to make remote work feasible. Um, publishers and libraries pulled together to expand access to critical research content. People found new ways to connect and care for one another from within their, their cyber silos. And so, as we emerge from the tunnel to this vastly altered world, how we accomplish the work of publishing, how we get our content where it needs to go, and how we view ourselves, our authors, and our readers are, are all you know, greatly transformed. And I think one huge lesson here is that a global health crisis precipitated change that video conferencing and other technologies on their own could not, right? So how momentous, as Kevin also said, to be telling the 100 plus staff of the MIT press, they have complete freedom to decide when to work from home and when at the office. And not only that, we're free to hire people now based outside our local area. So that's a huge boon in attracting a more diverse talent pool to our company and our industry. So there will be significant challenges in figuring out how to optimize for these new hybrid ways of collaborating and working, and especially with an eye towards equity and I think that this is really the planning process that's gonna consume us in the months ahead. 
people are still feeling very raw. They, they appreciate the new found flexibility, but they're also burnt out and still learning how to work remotely in a way that protects you know, non-work headspace. There, there's trauma and displacement that many of us are carrying for some time. It's not just communities, families, and jobs that are impacted, but research shows that brain wiring has changed too, right? So it's safest to assume that none of us are exactly the same individuals that we were pre-COVID. And so post-tunnel, this work of resetting and regrouping is really what's most important. Next, how are people discovering and consuming content going forward? So we know that the pandemic brought into relief how important access to credible research is, and, and not just for researchers, but also for policymakers and the global public. At the same time, it accelerated ongoing change in scholarly communication. So transformation that was definitely underway, but was you know, until now proceeding more gradually towards digital formats and OA on the one hand, commercial consolidation on the other, sped up significantly as a result of economic reversals and the global spotlight on structural inequities. I mean, even first world constructs of science and innovation are no longer adequate if, if they ever were. And so epistemologies themselves are expanding and that's had a big impact on academic publishing. So we publishers find ourselves reproducting strategic plans and budgets again and again as incumbent models for scholarly books and journals fail faster. On the book side, there's a shift from print to digital and audio, including library purchasing. On the journal side, open access and preprints. Um, and at the MIT Press, we quickly started at the start of the pandemic, Rapid Reviews COVID-19 is one example of an overlay journal. Overlay journals that peer review preprints represent a real sea change in science publishing in which speed and accountability become the critical criteria. So there's tremendous urgency now to make peer review more efficient and fair and reliable. And you know, while we were in our cyber bunkers, um, there was ever more competition for our limited attention spans, yet also increased demand for trustworthy content um, for real facts. Um, and as people you know, seek deeper understanding of infectious disease, a systemic racism and other looming topics. And so while well, early on book sales took a major hit at the start of the pandemic due to bookstore closures and other supply chain challenges, which by the way are still ongoing, uh, books in all formats as entertainment and books for general readers rebounded in a big way. And academic publishers with good trade lists and backlist on race and social movements fared especially well. But that excludes the vast majority of scholarly monographs, which have relied historically on library sales, as we know, and those sales no longer sustain them. And hence this move towards new models like um, MIT Press's direct to open, in which participating libraries contribute towards a threshold that allows us to open all of our monographs in each successive year funding these models once for the world, and at the same time, making OA publication accessible to all authors, regardless of their ability to uh, pay up front. And we're you know, far from the only publishers now uh, experimenting with these kinds of uh, new um, subscribe to open like open monograph models. So it's clear post pandemic that institutionally cemented OA for scholarly books is simply a better business model. Now this approach to sustainable monographs points towards what I see as a new compact between academic publishers and institutions in which university lead leaders embrace greater ownership and investment. So as we accept that established models are unfit for a post pandemic world of shrinking library budgets, um, inefficient journals, you know, languishing mon monographs and commercial monopolies, the imperative grows for universities to take on knowledge dissemination and infrastructure more directly. Going forward, I think we can also agree that the case for OA has been convincingly made and widely heard, even by commercial publishers. And so with that, the biggest opportunity becomes helping stakeholder communities build the alternatives to those entrenched models and platforms. I think we'll also be more discerning about open access. And so for example, you know, CC BY isn't always the right license. Publishers need the option to make content open without relinquishing control over how it's monetized or remixed downstream. Um, and 
I think I've seen many cases where, you know, an otherwise functioning OA model gets cannibalized or hurt, which hurts the broader mission. Similarly, we'll be smarter about the unintended consequences of models like APCs and transformative agreements and work towards alternatives that really prevent commercial hijacking of research content, data, infrastructure, and analytics. So the need for universities to move from commercial outsourcing to insourcing here also includes the design and application of metrics used to judge academic reputations. When we apply a DEI lens throughout this ecosystem, it becomes clear that equitable access is just one part of a greater advance that starts with addressing who can participate in the research enter enterprise and how excellence in knowledge creation and sharing is judged. So how do we build a publishing ecosystem that doesn't perpetuate or amplify entrenched bias, one that expands mechanisms of credit and attribution? That's the real priority going forward. And I'm seeing a lot more awareness of this across stakeholder groups now. So I envision values-driven publishers working with universities to modernize academic assessment and to diversify our reputational signals. Um, we can also think, I think publishers now recognize authors as paying customers more for a lot of reasons. And so publisher focus on author services will continue to grow. This includes providing information back to authors to support their, those, those impact narratives. Citations, book sales, article downloads, awards, reviews, media coverage, um, et cetera, tweets, all speak to the influence of an author's work. How we signal contribution and peer review rigor figures as a part of this currency too. So as scholarly publishers, we're responsible for helping authors achieve the recognition their ideas deserve within their own fields and institutions. And I think that's something that preprint servers and institutional repositories on their own are, are not currently equipped to do. So crises like the pandemic are opportunities for needed change. Um, I think we all agree that advances in research and how those advances are communicated are needed ammunition in facing global challenges like COVID-19 and, and climate chaos. Um, so we've seen up close the relationship between publishing ecosystems and the health of the research enterprise. And I've described um, what I see as a changed publishing landscape and a larger role for academic institutions. I think this may even involve new senior administrative positions with broader purview over knowledge infrastructure and data. Um, it definitely involves university presses and, and libraries and more collective investment across the academy. And I'll stop there. Oh, I should say, yeah, kumbaya. <laughs> That was a that was a wonderful story, and I keep wondering who this publisher was. And you're not going to tell us, but anyway, yeah, you could probably look it up. So true, yeah. true that. Um, so we have a question for you, Amy. Has the MIT Press changed its direction in any important respects, or are you intensifying the kind of passions and commitments from before? Are there any lessons from the pandemic that would have caused you to rethink the trajectory that the press is on? That, that is uh, such a good question. I, I, we've had so much discussion internally about you know, how, how what we've seen throughout the pandemic um, and the focus on systemic racism, um, you know, how it makes us think about our work and, and you know, I think we feel we feel very good about being an open access leader as we have been. We have felt, um, I think some people have expressed concern that the nature of our list, because it does focus, you know, more on science and technology and art and design, um, meant that we weren't going to be the publisher that published, you know, white fragility. But I think that people also, um, you know, recognize that we have tremendous power to diversify the voices that we bring into conversation about science and technology and art and design. Um, it's not that that hasn't been a focus in the past, but it's, it's much more of a focus now. Uh, we, you know, we had, um, we have an author who, who is a professor at MIT who has published quite a bit on science and innovation in Africa. And with him, we're starting a new series on global epistemologies, for example. Um, but that's, that's just one of many examples. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, let's push forward. I'm accumulating questions that will be very good for a group discussion after this uh, segment. So I'm going to ask your indulgence to now introduce Peter Brantley, uh, who is our technical guru and specialist among all. He is the director of online strategy for the University of California at Davis Library, where he directs the design of network applications that connect UC Davis to re research to the public. Previously, he was director of digital development at the New York Public Library, and before that, the director of scholarly communications at the open source nonprofit Hypothesis. He has worked at the Internet Archive on policy issues and open standards, and has managed technology groups at a variety of academic research libraries. He has served on advisory boards and several publishing groups and OER groups. So Peter, it's yours. Great, thanks, Anne. I'm gonna share my screen for some presentation slides here. And Hopefully that's available for view. Um, so I know time is short and I just wanna um, share some of my thoughts about what I've seen happening over the last year and a half and what some of the ramifications might be for the future. And I have to start off by, um, by noting that as a member of the University of California, one of the most momentous things that's happened over the last year is that the University of California actually managed yesterday to migrate to its first ever true consortial ILS. This is a really big deal at the University of California. We've worked with Melville, a, a holding aggregation, holdings aggregation for uh, almost 40 years. And so this is a, a very significant step. And it's really the first time that all the campuses participated in a big project together. And what's really noted, noted, notable about it is that staff really deep in all of our organizations worked together on teams and in working groups, making decisions, working with each other across their own individual libraries and into the, into the larger university. And I think this kind of empowerment really grew everybody's expertise, everybody's competence, um, and everybody's comfort with moving forward together as an institution. And I think moving into this kind of cross-institution project, this heavy collaboration uh, enables the university for the first time to think about future similar efforts that draw us together, that share our staffs across the institutions. And I think what's really, you know, potentially um, uh, sort of important about this uh, time in the last year is that in some ways, I think the move to a virtual work environment enabled this to happen more efficiently with more equity among our staff, uh, a, a greater sense of participation, and without some of the hierarchy that might have hindered people's ability to contribute in the way that they would have in a pre-virtual environment. Now, let me focus a little bit on some of the things that have happened in digital learning and instruction and how they impact libraries. So first, over this last year, uh, academic year, the UC Davis Bookstore launched a new, very innovative program called Equitable Access. This builds on the inclusive access type system that bookstores have been moving to to uh, provide greater access to electronic texts and through platforms. Equitable Access is a capitated program that lowers barriers to text acquisition by, their, by our students. So the way equitable access works is the bookstore has negotiated with, with each publisher to determine a per text, per student, per, per quarter fee. And the result of that is that the bookstore is, is enabling a single charge per student, per quarter, where the student can gain access to all of their texts. So in this last year, each student paid $199 per quarter and had access to their entire textbook portfolio. This coming year, because of further savings, we'll be able to drop that to $169 per student per quarter. Now, this is really a phenomenal change. And although in some ways, uh, social, and, uh, human social science and humanities or the 
the uh, the well uh, population and, and in some ways might not benefit as much through this program. Um, STEM students do. And in terms of being able to provide greater equity of access to STEM majors for the economically disadvantaged among our students, this has been a huge win. And in addition, the library has partnered with the bookstore to further our open access list and to increase our licensing of books so that students can gain access to some of the texts that they need through the library directly rather than through a traditional textbook platform process. And this has also saved students hundreds of thousands of dollars per quarter. I think the advantage of equitable access is that it's been an opt out basis so people are automatically opted in. <clears throat> Excuse me, and we've seen very, very few students actually decide to opt out, which has been very heartwarming. Another thing that we've seen over the last year, uh, which is very surprising to us, is that we've actually seen a 30% drop in, a, in adopted traditional text through learning platforms. We don't know, of course, whether this is a trend that will continue or uh, if it will be reversed to some extent, but because of virtual instruction and, and the um, uh, need for instructors to engage students online, we've seen uh, instructors migrate to podcasts and science blogs, newsletters and preprints, and a wide range of other types of content that are web native or internet native that allow students to work with them directly rather than through uh, traditional learning platforms. So that's been a very interesting trend. It also feeds, I think, into investments we're seeing into open educational resources and their development and adoption. And that's been the case throughout the entire state here. So we've seen that in the community college uh, system, the California State University system, as well as at the University of California. And I know many states are actually hosting conferences about OER uh, this summer into the fall and winter, and certainly California is doing the same across all of our higher educational institutions this coming week, actually, where we'll be showcasing and highlighting some of the changes and investments that we're making in OER. And in fact, this last week for the first time, OER was presented to the University of California Regents as a way to help reduce the financial burden on our students. So I think this is a growing space for investment. At UC Davis, my institution, we've just launched something called Aggie Open to further the uh, uh, creation and adoption of OER materials. And I think one of the interesting sort of tweaks about that is, is that we're working with the bookstores equitable access program where text, open texts that are adopted into uh, equitable access are actually taxed a little bit and those funds are then flowed back into the Aggie Open Initiative to further the adoption and creation of OER materials. So in this way, we're working very closely together to try to provide an ongoing funding support for OER. Now, I think many of us have seen this huge growth over the last year and a half in digital ILL and e-reserve usage. And so not surprisingly, uh, there's been a marked uptick in adoption of remote lending opportunities. And I think uh, the Internet Archives open library efforts and certainly Hathi Trust's ETOS programs were significant triggers in opening the eyes of our institutions to the advantages of controlled digital lending efforts. And I think we've seen this huge surge in the last few months of uh, institutions, both small and large, uh, beginning to explore setting up their own local uh, CDL initiatives. And I think what's particularly heartening about this is that uh, institutions are not doing this blindly um, or without heed to uh, the copyright industry, the publishing industry. I think there are a lot of explorations of how to engage in CDL that's, um, that's respecting uh, e-books e and other types of uh, e-licensed materials that are out in the marketplace, but recognizing that there are a large number of print books that otherwise just would not be available for remote uh, acquisition, remote reading, remote learning. Uh, I think it's a really good sign that NISO is very actively right now encouraging industry-wide discussion in controlled digital lending best practices and how to build a CDL um, 
sort of infrastructure uh, that respects publishing rights, but also respects the needs for libraries to do the business that, that we are here for, which is lending our works to each other and making our books available to students. So I think we'll see a lot of investment in this area. And I, I'm really hopeful that uh, this can be a very healthy growth um, uh, sort of application space for us. And because of this, I, the other thing I think uh, that's following on from that is that there's been a huge surge of interest in general open ebook lending platforms. And part of the reason for that is that in the commercial space, if you think about ebook lending, uh, 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 providers like Overdrive and uh, 3M and so forth, you know, there's really not much room for local bookshelves, for institutions to stand up their own local ebook, digital book. Uh, lending platforms. And so out of the controlled digital lending initiatives, we see software emerging that helps to address this need. So for example, uh, Caltech is beginning to offer an open tech solution, sorry, open source solution called Dibs. Fordham is, is releasing for the community some of the work that it's done. And we're seeing many other efforts come up that try to fill this space so that institutions can create their own local book lending op opportunities for their patrons. A lot of this work builds on work that was done at the New York Public Library, where NYPL invested in building a, a mobile reader called Simply E and a lending platform and bookshelf platform called Library Simplified, which works with a protocol called Open Publication Distribution System or OPDS, which is essentially an RSS for books that incorporates support explicitly for lending and uh, copy protection and, and other uh, sort of parameters around traditional lending experiences. This space has also seen uh, some significant investment very recently where the Knight Foundation and others have provided support for Lyricist and the Digital Public Library of America to build out and fork some of this NYPL investment into a new initiative called the Palace Project, which ultimately hopes to be able to provide these kinds of lending platforms for a wide range of libraries and institutions seeking to provide broader digital access to their print materials and book materials uh, to a reading audience. And that's it for me. So I thank you for this opportunity to speak and welcome any opportunities that you might have uh, to address questions. Um, yeah, Peter, we have one question for you, which is, are the UCs actually doing controlled digital lending? That's a great question. So um, from, from their collections? Right. So um, not yet, uh, but there are a variety of uh, phone calls and committees and Slack groups um, in place. Uh, some institutions are a little bit further ahead in investigating this than others. Uh, so uh, Berkeley is beginning to stand up uh, some uh, uh, course reserve support, um, some ILL support, but it's, it's not really in place. It's not a CDL program per se, but there are many conversations across the university libraries at this point, um, and to some extent coordinated through the uh, California Digital Library. So stay tuned. Are the impediments legal or, or what are they? Um, I think the, the impediment is to come up with best practices and policy guidelines for um, what types of books should be eligible for uh, inclusion in CDL and under what terms can they be made available. So, you know, I, I think that there, uh, what we, we will likely see as uh, the, an industry, uh, thinking of libraries as an industry, is that we will uh, attempt to identify works that we feel comfortable lending because they're not available um, in any reasonable way through a, a licensed or um, purchased form in a, a digital uh, instance. Um, you know, so a class of materials that um, might be a little bit older, might be, uh, might never have uh, been negotiated for digital rights and so forth. And I think we'll start with a, a fairly circumscribed set of of use cases, uh, certain types of course reserves or um, ILL, and then building out to explore the possibility uh, perhaps of, of what would a cross institution um, CDL look like? So in, the, in the, something more like HathiTrust, you know, so imagining a world where 
um, Berkeley could lend uh, a CDL copy to Stanford. How could we do that? What are the parameters around that? So I, I think we'll take a series of steps. Uh, I think we'll be very in invested in continuing the conversation within NISO and among publishers to try to figure out as a, as a broader information access industry, um, how to move forward in a responsible way. Thank you. I, I guess to some extent, the outcome of the Internet Archive AAP uh, litigation might be a, a instructive here, although that's not an identical situation. I think in the interest of time, let us push on to uh, Rob Manuel. We have a number of questions that have piled up, but I, I, I'm hoping we can get to them before the um, less than an hour is up. So our next presenter is Rob Manuel. He's been president of the University of Indianapolis since 2012, where he led a strategic vision that resulted in stronger financial stability, increased retention, and significantly improved graduation rates. He came to Indianapolis after seven years as Dean of the School of Continuing Studies and Vice Provost at Georgetown, where he carried through a complete transformation and dramatic expansion of the university's continuing education programs, including the opening of Georgetown downtown a facility designed to bring Georgetown to the very diverse Washington DC community. Before that, he worked in enrollment managing and continuing education as associate dean at New York University. So uh, Rob, are you here? I am here. I hope you can oh, hear good. me. Thanks. Uh, first, thanks for having me. I'm delighted to be here and spend some time with you. I realized, though, that I watched Sesame Street growing up, and I kind of am that thing that doesn't look like the other things in this conversation. I represent an organization that might be a little different from uh, the organizations that have uh, presented before me. And so I wanted to start with a little bit of context. There's a slide that I hope we can show at some point here, which details a little bit of the demographics of my institution. These are important because the problems that we have and the tools that we have to get through COVID are very different at my institution than they might be at some of yours. Uh, and so questions of equity and inclusion and questions of continuation uh, because of our student profile, where we have 54% of our students who are Pell eligible and 48% who are first generation college student means something different. We didn't have the luxury in any capacity to stop even for a day because more than half of the students that live with us didn't have better living environments to go home to to live out the uh, the pandemic and so we we moved from an educational institution to a to a, a caregiving institution at times as we need to get people through through these homes and it reminds me that the you know everybody the lumps kind of higher ed into this monolithic uh, entity and we really are different so the storm is the same but our boats are very different as we try to get through these these storms as we go and my context for today is if you look at these numbers just know that what i'm talking about is uh coming from the organizational uh, leader of an institution that looks like this that looks like the stuff you have on your screen uh, and i'll give you some thoughts about what has changed and what the impact will be just know that they're specific to what kind of institution the University of Indianapolis is. The other thing I would say is that for us, uh, the charge for me today was to talk about the light at the end of the tunnel. And uh, that light source keeps moving. Uh, just this week, it moved a couple miles further down the road. And we're getting whiplash coming through all of this because the uh, political and science communities at the municipal, state, and federal level are all speaking different languages, and it's very difficult to figure out a path forward uh, and how you're going to, uh, especially in the Midwest, how you're going to determine uh, what path we take in order to get through this. And just this morning when we realized that our state's vaccination rates are significantly low and we're in a hot area, um, our length of, of the tunnel becomes a little bit longer than maybe some of yours do. The other thing that makes it uh, difficult to understand when an end would come is the financial impact on our communities. Everybody talks about this K recovery where some, some uh, 
industries recover faster than others. Well, most of our students and their parents are working in industries that will take a much longer period of time to recover than others. And so their financial um, strengths are harmed, not just as long as the virus is with us, but until a time at such a time that their economic resources recover. So um, you're familiar with the ways that colleges and universities have gone viral in a very short time, and you're familiar with uh, the furlough, the layoffs, the enrollment hits that were that happened and were needed. And a majority of institutions were required to draw more than usual amounts from their endowments just to cover operating expenses in the last year and a half. Um, and these are all the micro level decisions that I expect to be kind of overturned or changed when we come through the COVID tunnel, whenever, whenever that is. Those are the short term pain points for us, uh, but they're certainly not the long term pain points. What I rather wanted to cover with you were some of the things that I think change, at least in my organization, uh, that will have a greater impact on our ability to do work. Uh, and the first is a, is a rethinking of the importance of some of our degrees. So degrees like education and nursing have become commodified over the past 10 or 15 years. And in fact, there's a lot of studies out that say you, you shouldn't pay more than X number of dollars to get a degree in education because your salary will never overcome that. The nursing uh, has become very transactional. Students will come to our place wanting to study nursing and really want to do an ROI calculation on whether or not it's worth it to get itself through. But as we move into an understanding of what really gets us through the, the pandemic and the role that specifically teachers and nurses have, at least my community out in the Midwest has become to understand, has come to understand how important those professions are, how needed they are and that we should take a little more care of them as we move as we move through. Um, every family with a child who had to work through the pandemic understands how necessary teacher and child care is. Any loved one who had to put a, a family member in a facility understands the importance of the caregiving units inside of there. And I'm not sure how long that good will last, but I can see some of the public policy and funding things change in those areas uh, to accommodate the growth of them as a, as a profession. Second, I see, I, I am seeing, and I hope it continues, a silencing of the kind of convenient and lazy research that uh, calls for the demise of certain units of higher education around the country. Um, just last year and a half, there have been four uh, studies that have come out that have called, that have said in any number of capacities, the University of Indianapolis will go out of business and not only were they shoddy research, but they were really difficult uh, to my community who was trying to find a way through this pandemic and then seeing um, you know, research things being bandied around that say we're in trouble was, was really difficult. And I, I, some of those are, are also um, really stable organizations like when S&P Standard & Poor's uh, did a kind of a dramatic system-wide downgrade of higher education. That might hurt some institutions in one way, but to those of us who who manage uh, large debt loads, it, it hurts us in, in other ways. And I am glad that uh, because the institutions, again, in my category, are making it through the pandemic and actually financially thriving through the pandemic, uh, we're, we're seeing that a lot of the shoddy research doesn't hold, doesn't hold true. I'm also seeing on my campus that we are restructuring decision-making based on skill set rather than position title or time in, in on task. And so the there are people around the university who have skills that could be used to solve unique new problems that are put on the table. And we're simply bringing them on board and having them uh, serve the role that they can based on their function versus just their title. And that may have long-term effects for how the university operates in the long haul but it has allowed us uh, to make quicker, more informed and deep decisions uh, along, along the way. Uh, we are institutions now that are very serious about planning. We've been burned, uh, we feel it. We feel the human toll that this last year and a half has taken and we don't wanna go through that again. We also know, however, that in just four or five short years, we have a demographic cliff in our enrollments that is gonna occur in terms of the number of students graduating from high school. And we see this as an opportunity to bulletproof ourselves through that next 
um, enrollment pandemic that might come around in five years. And so there is a tremendous amount of goodwill in our faculty and our staff and even our students and, uh, and donors to think about the very, very tough questions that we haven't been able to address for the last 40, 50 years now so that we don't have to relive these situations going forward. Part of that is, uh, as a fifth thing, is to see um, that technology can be a real enhancer and promoter uh, instead of something that replaces or kills education. You all know that we turned, well, we at the university turned 4,300 sections online in about four days. Uh, and while that was nobody's preferred mode of delivery, we were able to look at the, some of the benefits of the technology and how that might enhance things like access and equity uh, and also time to degree as we move forward. And I see now coming out of the tunnel that technology is somewhat of a friend uh, and less of a foe as we begin to move that through that. The other thing that this pandemic is allowing us to do or perhaps requiring us to do is make real decisions about what we own versus what we partner to get. So we have identified the pieces at the university that are required for us to be able to deliver our mission, to educate our students and have the institutional effect that we want to have on our students. Now we're going through to determine whether we need to build that ourselves or we need to partner with the five or six really prominent universities around here to help us access those services. Certainly library services is, could be one of those given the educational units that exist around us. And the last thing I would tell you is uh, cash and liquidity is now king. Um, most institutions that I speak with are interested in building up cash reserve so that if something like this happened again, there wasn't an automatic uh, cliff that you fell off and had to figure out how to finance the rest of, of your life. And again, this is a is situational and specific to, to my institution and institutions like me. Um, the other thing is that credit agencies are looking in order to access debt, credit agencies are looking very, very heavily at how liquid you are and how much cash you have on hand in order to um, accommodate, accommodate uh, interruptions in service over time. And the board, boards that are looking at operations of universities are beginning to change their thought on just simply using debt as a leverage and requiring presidents and leaders at institutions to think both about growth and about savings. And so the, how do we become relevant now and how do we become generationally solvent uh, in the future? That's a particularly tricky question because in the past it's been either or. So I thought I'd end rather than telling you what I see the future of UIndy is as it comes into, into the view of librarians and information scientists and technologists, I thought I'd leave you with an idea about how, if you're struggling to make the case at the university about your relevance, how, how you might begin to think about that. Uh, and one of the best examples was just given by Peter and, and uh, UC Davis. In fact, if we can uh, plagiarize that and bring that to the University of Indianapolis, I would, I would be grateful. But the, the thought I had is, um, as we look at the problems and as leaders put the problems on the table, we need to find ways to have traditional parts of the organization scaffold the success of those problems. And for us with 48% first generation and 54% Pell, we have a cost issue going on. The rising cost to keep our operation going means that people without uh, cash or without uh, the ability to pay have difficulty as, as costs are increased at the university. And so whenever there's a solution on the table that helps us continue to gain access to the things we need to develop our education and reduces the cost to the student, that thing gets first to my table uh, and comes to my table often. And then the second is you have a unique set of skills, especially around uh, data management, logical, organizational business uh, development stuff. It would be terrific to see how we could tap into those uh, skills or how you could use those skills to help the issues that the university is seeing as it moves forward as it moves forward. We just completed and received a $12 million grant uh, to produce uh, some data analytics programming, which allows us to understand the probability that somebody enrolling will stay one term, one year, two years, three years, and four years. And then we are able to craft our uh, interventions accordingly. 
and that probability changes over time as a result. Well, that thinking uh, came out of a lot of different areas around the university, including um, our libraries. And I, I can see in institutions like mine, looking around the university to find those skill sets to be able to apply them to the problem that exists there. Um, I, as I said earlier when I started, it, it's really difficult to see an end to this thing just yet. And maybe that's situational. That might be in the Midwest where vaccination rates are lower and the uptick on mask wearing is low. Uh, but uh, I am noticing that as the world begins to uncover and come out, that um, people's attitudes are increasing, uh, are getting better. Uh, and the one thing that I'm hearing from almost everybody is that for us, community matters. For our institution, being back together is one of the things that differentiates us and allows us to take our students through the educational path of being on campus and having the experience we want them to have. And so we're fighting tooth and nail, not to go back to where we were before, but to make sure that whatever we do build has the ability to be done in community. I'll leave you there, and thanks again for allowing me some time to talk. Thank you so much, Rob. Um, you wondered why you were here, but you were a very intentional choice, and you more than fulfilled our expectations. I have a number of questions for you, but in the interest of time, I'm only, I think, going to ask one. Uh, and that is, you spoke of tough questions that haven't been answered in the last 40 or 50 years. Can you give some examples? Mm -hmm. uh, so th there was a question earlier in here about um, equity in terms of the work environment for people of different sources. Well, we, we know that if we, if we allow some categories of workers to work from home and others not to, we, we build up another form of inequity that just lives over the, the current structure that exists. And so rather than take the immediate problem, we're addressing now the systemic one. And instead of saying that there is a set of university um, benefits that exist for employees at the university, we're trying to structure benefits so that they're more meaningful to the employment employer type and, and help them understand their, their worth to the university. Vacation days may differ, may differ. Um, advice and counseling around um, retirement may differ, all within legal guidelines, of course, but structuring them different so that they can, they can do that. And in the case of faculty and administrators, in an institution that wants to be together collectively and start working in community, it's, it's a little harder to say you can work at home and we can accomplish that. And that fundamentally is our mission. So we have to be careful about how we manage that. However, there are lots of employment categories around campus where that is not necessarily the case. And so we would look at those separately and move them forward. Another is curricular relevance. Uh, we have a, a situation at the university where um, our, in education, for example, where you have to get your, your undergraduate degree in the field of study, so math or English, and then you have to take education courses, those two departments have lived separately for quite some time. And while there's 120 credit requirement to get your bachelor's degree, you need 153 or four to get out of the English program. And so not only is it a commodified field, but now it's a difficult field to get through. And we're losing enrollments as a result of having an ineffective way to get through that, uh, that educational path. One of the things that this has allowed us to do is bring together those units and say, why don't you figure out a path that works both for the student and for your educational needs to be able to move us forward? I hope that helped. Yeah, thank you, thank you. I mean, an underlying theme of various questions that have come in have to do with uh, whether we privilege or whether we disempower students or staff through remote or in-person uh, participation. And we don't have time to go into that, but thank you for touching upon it in, in your answer. I think I'm going to exercise a chair's prerogative and in the interest of hearing from our remaining three speakers, we will actually move on now to our librarian cohort, which will start with a presentation by Mimi Coulter. She's currently the deputy university librarian at Stanford Libraries. She has been responsible for operations and the implementation of strategic projects with special focuses 
on capital project implementation, organizational development, and copyright issues. However, her current focus is also on a transition, as I believe on October 1st, she will be joining Washington University in St. Louis as their vice provost and university librarian. So welcome and congratulations to uh, Mimi. Thanks very much, Anne. Okay, hold on. Just gonna try to share my screen. Hopefully you can all see my slides. Yes. Okay, terrific. Um, all right, I will, I, I think there's gonna be some good and interesting overlap between what I've, uh, what I've got to say and what we've already heard from some of the other speakers. And so in the interest of time, I'm gonna go relatively quickly. Um, I, I, I'm just focusing on services. There've been a lot of discussions that I've been having about what it means to come out on the other side of the tunnel and where we want our service, uh, where we want our libraries to be. Um, services has been a particular focus for me. Um, so I, um, I thought I would just sort of look at, at the services and at a really high level, what services are the hottest topics and, and getting the most attention. Um, questions of, of uh, building reopening, how we are opening our buildings and, and um, making ourselves accessible is a big one. Um, it, you know, it, we we shut down a lot of our we shut down a lot of our spaces physically, and how and when it is most appropriate to open them really is a can prove to be a challenging question, and it gets to, back to a lot of these equity uh, equity questions that we have been talking about in in that a lot of the other speakers have, have met, mentioned. You know, sort of understanding uh, who has to come to campus and who has to be in place to keep the doors open. Um, and and the the role of keeping those doors open is a is a is a has has a lot of challenges around it. So that opening hours question is a big one, and it also goes to to staffing questions as we look at some of the the budget issues that I know a lot of us are are facing. Um, paging services are an interesting one. Uh, we we know that there are a lot of folks who implemented additional paging services as a way of making uh, print materials more accessible when buildings were closed. And so now how and when we, um, we either rescind those services or change the way we manage those services and what capacity we have to staff them uh, has been a, an ongoing uh, source of discussion. Uh, course reserves is a particular pain point, but really the this is a bigger question about digital access to collections. And uh, Peter did a great job of talking about a lot of the discussions that are going around going on around uh, digital lending, controlled digital lending, the impact of the Hathitrust ETAS service on the way people think about access to these materials. And you know, I will echo that we're. Uh, I've been having a lot of the same kind of conversations about what is the most uh, appropriate and considered way to implement uh, some flavor of, of controlled digital lending or, or digital access to materials. Um, and, and course reserves is one place that it, it bubbles up and is a place where we had to make changes to accommodate more virtual learning and thinking about how we um, manage course reserves as the as our we move away from that virtual learning to some extent um, is a is a again ongoing discussion um, you know reference and research support I know there was a, a question in the chat about how we uh, think about reference we've you know, moved a lot of reference services online and uh, turned to um, additional virtual services there and um, it, you know Thinking about what that means for our service model going forward is is important. Uh, the the reference and research support is some of the most has been some of the most hands on work that uh, librarians and uh, particularly librarians with the, the subject focus have been doing, and has been an important way that we build relationships with faculty and graduate students uh, in in particular. And so. Um, what that balance is between virtual service and uh, a more in-person hands-on service, how we um, how we manage the 
manage those relationships as we change the location that those discussions take place has has been really interesting. And then the sort of everything, uh, you know, this has uh, this is just the recognition of the fact that this really is an inflection point. Um, uh, changes in the air, and so uh, there's there's enough change in all of these other services that that thinking about the the overall package is something that um, I, that I think we all we all really need to do. And I think uh, you know I think all of my colleagues who have spoken so far have have really gotten around to this point that there's there's a there's a really uh, big picture assessment of what library services are and and what they ought to be going on right now. Um, the, the discussion of those, of those services or all of those services is going on in the, in the light of um, some particular changes. Uh, we've had changes in patron expectations. Uh, you know, the, to the extent faculty have changed the way they are teaching because they are teaching more remotely, moving things, uh, moving things more virtual. We therefore have different uh, expectations about how we support classes, and uh, you know, some of this goes back to that whole course reserves question that I that I've mentioned earlier. Uh, it, uh, patrons have developed different expectations about how we are, are serving out material. We've, there's come to be an increasing reliance on, uh, on virtual resources. HathiTrust ETAS had a, a big role in this. Uh, so, you know, there's a, uh, the whole, even the whole paging question of, you know, how much we are willing to uh, physically move materials and, and deliver materials versus wanting patrons to come into the library is a, is a, a piece of that change in patron expectations. Uh, we're in the midst of organization expectations, changing organization expectations. And um, this, is, uh, this is a place where this, the question of remote work uh, looms large and, and several, several folks have, have already mentioned this. Um, there, I don't feel like there's a consensus. Uh, I don't feel like there's a real consensus around what is appropriate in terms of, of remote work. Um, this is the, the real ongoing source of debate as to whether the, uh, the on-campus experience is critical and to be prioritized and therefore bringing, uh, bringing staff and, and faculty and others back to campus uh, is important or whether this really has broadened our horizons and we should be looking to have more remote workers. Uh, the, there's a lot of discussion of the difference and distinction and where the lines are between fully remote work and, uh, oops, and sorry, and, uh, and an increased reliance on telecommuting and allowing people to work from home, uh, you know, or work remotely one or two or, or three days a week. Um, and how that gets integrated into our services is, uh, um, is really important. Uh, also, the other big change in organization expectations is often around budget. I think there's uh, there's a lot of places where we've we've faced cuts and are, are continuing to face them, and there is that expectation uh, that, that libraries will be doing more with less. Uh, uh, staff expectations have changed. I realize I've got a typo in my slide there, but um, the you know staff have become accustomed to working more remotely. Uh, you know, managers have gotten more experienced in managing remote workers. We've really had to have some thought about how we can uh, perform various aspects of our work uh, uh, in, a, in a more dispersed manner. And so you know, staff expectations, much like organization expectations have, have changed around what people are willing to do. We had a, a comment earlier about, uh, you know, Staff simply saying that they will not come back, and that there are certainly cases where that is uh, is impacting the ability of of libraries to uh, to implement to you know, return to to previous services, and is impacting the way we think about the services that we we perform. And then capacity. Uh, this is this goes back to some of the budget questions. You know, as we face staff cuts, there there might be. We might have visions for what we would like services to be, uh, an idealized version of, of where we would like the library to be performing, but what can we realistically 
undertake uh, from both a collections and a staffing standpoint as we uh, as we deal with reduced uh, uh, reduced resources. Uh, so uh, just uh, this is a little a little bit overly simplistic, but I think it's worth uh, worth putting out there as some of the assess the sort of four buckets of assessment that that I'm seeing. Um, there is a, there's a tendency to uh, to stick to the top half of the of the square there and think about you know whether uh, this particular service or whatever we're doing in this area was better now or is better now or was better uh, in the before times and you know should we be returning to the to the previous version should we be keeping what we've got um, but I think it really much more I'll, pretty much all of the services that I'm, I'm seeing discussed are actually falling into that lower left quadrant of we don't know yet. Uh, you know, we haven't we really haven't found the new normal in a lot of different, uh, lot of different places. And what, where we really are going to end up is some sort of hybrid version of what we used to do and what we did during COVID. And uh, we're still trying to, to find that, uh, that, you know, Goldilocks, that Goldilocks spot where we're providing the, all of the services that we uh, need to or want to. Um, and I don't wanna leave out that category of maybe not. I think this goes back to the capacity question of we need to be uh, ready and willing to uh, you know, find things that we're going to stop doing. And uh, those can be some challenging conversations, but I think ones that are uh, the ones that are important to have. Um, that was quick, but I'm gonna stop there. I, I wanna make sure we have time to hear from my, uh, from my other colleagues. Thank you, Mimi, and in the interest of time, I'm going to introduce Nancy. Nancy has done us the enormous favor and privilege of fitting us in when she's actually on her way to another destination and I believe is at an airport. But Nancy is that sort of person. She will do everything she can to contribute and help out. Uh, I believe she has a hard stop in about 15 minutes, so I want to, res I need to respect that. Uh, Nancy Kirkpatrick is the executive director and CEO of OhioNet, the consortium. She has over a decade of experience working in and with libraries, including as the director of library services at Marion University in Indianapolis. It's probably before Rob's time. A 2005 Spectrum Scholar, she holds appointments on ALA's Spectrum Advisory Board and the Diversity Research Grants Committee. Her research and writing interests include managing change, authentic leadership, and organizational design, especially as examined through an appreciative inquiry or AI lens. Before entering librarianship, she practiced nonprofit law and advocacy, she holds a JD degree from the University of Richmond and a master in library and information science from the University of Illinois at Sher uh, Urbana-Champaign. So thank you, Mimi, for making time for us. You're welcome, uh, Anne, and hopefully the sound is okay. I do apologize. I am traveling today, so uh, things are a little crazy, but uh, thank you for that introduction and for the invitation. I, um, I wanna start my uh, comments off by saying, uh, by quoting the uh, often imitated, never duplicated Australian rapper Iggy Azalea in her hit song Fancy, first things first, I'm a realist. Um, we are living in truly strange times, and I was very encouraged to hear uh, the, my colleagues before me talk about how they're approaching access accessibility and what kind of things you're doing in response to that, um, because that's some of the stuff that I will touch on here. Um, You've heard also today, but even before today from me that the COVID-19 pandemic has truly shown a light on the inequities in our society broadly and really in our profession specifically. And this isn't really a surprise because we're a reflection of our environments. Um, I think what maybe makes it feel like a surprise is a combination of Fobazi Itar's vocational awe. And my sort of shorthand for that is but we're all librarians. We would never. We're here to save the world. We're above reproach, um, colliding with a hard reality that best intentions are truly not enough. Uh, assuming best intent is not something that people of color and other minoritized populations can necessarily rely on. But I also, uh, like I said, I am encouraged by what I, I heard today. So 
Um, now, I didn't share that to bring you down um, because remember, first things first, I'm a realist. So, uh, or as my mother used to call me, a pragmatic optimist. So, but I didn't feel like I could address where I think we might be headed without acknowledging where we are and where we are needs a little work. But I find that exciting because if we have work to do, that means we still have opportunity for positive change. Um, the second thing I wanted to share, and if you are a proper grammar type out there, I will apologize in advance because this is gonna be a very bumpy uh, sentence for you. Post COVID ain't real. And I said what I said. A post pandemic world, uh, a world where we get back to the normal that existed before this particular pandemic seems unlikely due to many factors that you guys have already discussed and that we could spend a whole nother day talking about. Um, but I don't think that's a bad thing. Uh, in fact, I think it's really exciting that we are not going back to things uh, like they used to be because pre-pandemic life was not bliss for all of us in the library world. Uh, the existence of challenges in our profession have been discussed ad nauseum in library literature and by librarians at ALA conferences since literally the beginning of librarianship. We know that our field does not accurately represent the diversity of our communities. We know that the pipeline to leadership favors particular groups of people and that the path to faculty status and tenure is uncertain and attainable for many and not for lack of education, intelligence, hard work, or determination. So what, you might be asking yourself, uh, is she here to preach or share what she believes the future holds from her savvy executive perspective? The answer, my friends, is yes. I don't want to go back to pre-pandemic levels of normalcy because now more than ever, people are recognizing that normalcy was not actually normal or good for everyone. I'm excited because we have an opportunity to do better. We have a chance to demonstrate our real commitment to the values our profession proclaims to hold dear. We can not only imagine what a just, equitable, diverse, and inclusive future looks like, we can make it a reality. What does doing better look like? I think it really starts with being thoughtful and realistic in our needs assessment. Don't assume you know what your community needs, whether that be your library staff, your patrons, or your faculty. Ask them, build trust with them, create safe spaces for conversations, and then ask them questions like, what does an inclusive work environment look like? Describe it to me. How would you know your workplace valued you? Tell me about that. How might the library support faculty engagement in new or different ways? Describe a time the library really saved the day when it comes to a research project you were working on or a grant you were applying for. How has your curriculum changed with the move to online courses? What has worked well for you in this new environment? And do you need more support in any particular area? Describe your ideal teaching environment and tell me what role the library plays. And last on that library side, does our collection, both leisure and scholarly, reflect the diversity of our community? Why or why not? And what can we do today to start changing that? We are at our core and by our training, information scientists. So find a way to gather all the data you need, whether that's through surveys, conversations, literature churches, or just building relationships, and use that data to make decisions that support the changes you know need to be made moving forward. And as good information scientists, realize that you don't have to start from scratch. Um, while, there, while every library is absolutely special and unique, there are also many commonalities. Perhaps some of the work done at your colleague's library or institution is applicable to your situation. If you don't know how to design a good survey tool, find somebody who can and work with them. If trust has been fractured at your organization and relationships are tense, hire an outside facilitator to come in and help work through those starting conversations. Wherever you decide to start, find a way to start now. And I have one caveat performative work is not welcome here. The reality of living in a pandemic is that divisions between leadership and frontline staff, for example, have often become wider. And that was just discussed um, earlier today. So one really only need to look at social media like library Twitter or the ALA think tank on Facebook to see daily examples of librarians and library staff who feel undervalued by their organizations often these same organizations that believe they're doing great work. And you know what? Both can be true. 
those libraries can be doing great work while undervaluing their staff. We all can and should learn from the past 18 months and our experiences of providing services in new ways. If you didn't come out of this a changed organization, I would ask why. Specifically, what did you learn in the last 18 months about how you provide services and what is truly essential? How much work can be done remotely? Does that flexibility result in better quality of life for your team? Was that flexibility offered equitably to staff at all levels of the organization? Why or why not? Can some aspects of that flexibility um, be retained as you start to return to the office? How were you successful in meeting the needs of your students and your faculty during the last year? And what successes can be replicated and continued moving forward? I don't know what the future holds uh, in library world, but I think my simple answer is whatever we decide to create. And I hope that we make so it something good for all of us. So thank you for the, giving me the opportunity. And I don't have, I have, I can be here until three. I don't have a hard stop, but I want to hear what Jim has to say. So I will mute myself now until, uh, unless Anne has any questions for me. Sorry, now I had to unmute myself. Um, okay, I'm not sure, just a minute. I stepped away from, from the um, machine for a moment, so I need to catch up with what's in the chat. Um, Nancy, somebody asked a while back, and this is a very specific question, uh, could diversity be served by allowing more remote work, like for people with disabilities or people who are scared to come back to work or whatever? How is your organization dealing with that? And how, how are what, whatever you know about your Ohio colleagues thinking about that? Uh, uh, yes, diversity could be helped. Diversity in an organization could be helped by allowing for more remote work. Um, I've seen not at my organization in particular, because we're allowing people to continue to work remotely, whatever serves them best. So our office is open and people can come in if they'd like, but they don't have to, there's no requirement right now. Um, but I've seen that for a lot of um, librarians and especially librarians of color, working remotely has allowed them to finally fully get into their job and enjoy it in the way that they never did before, because frankly, they're not dealing with microaggressions every day. So that's, a, that's not a great answer, but if you can allow, um, continued remote work while you address the fact that microaggressions shouldn't be occurring at work and then bring people back to a better environment. I think that's probably the winning combination. Not easy to do, but certainly worth striving for. Well, I congratulate you for being brave enough to get on a plane. Yeah, well, my mask is on the other side of the iPad, so <laughs> I'm all set. Okay, wish you a good, good journey and, and thank you. Thank you for making you. it. So um, our final speaker is going to be Jim O'Donnell, who's university librarian and professor of history at the Arizona State University. After serving for 10 years as provost at Georgetown, and before that for six years as chief information officer at the University of Pennsylvania. In his distinguished academic career as a classics professor, he has been recognized as a fellow of the Medieval Academy and has served as president of the American Philological Association and also chair for some years of the board of directors of the American Council of Learned Societies. So let's see what he thinks now that he's in a library leadership position. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Anne, and good morning, everybody. All changed, changed utterly. A terrible beauty is born. That was William Butler Yeats on the morning after the Irish Revolution of 1916. Like all the best prophets, Yeats was both right and wrong. In some ways, Ireland would never be the same again. And in some ways, the imagined transformation took another 70 years until the birth of the Celtic tiger. It's easy to think and say that in a world of pandemic, climate change, and a new contest for democratic governance in many countries, we must be living in a time of transformation like nothing since the 1960s. On that grand and turmoiled stage, how will we be affected? I'm gonna to focus today on collections. 
Uh, libraries aren't only collections, they're more than collections, but you wouldn't have libraries without collections. What have we learned in this year? What are we seeing? I have three observations. Number one, the age of digital transformation is over. It's done. Digital content has won. For 25 years, we have juggled and balanced two media, two modes of knowing, print and digital. But a year of closed buildings and a year when we were even afraid to touch our most precious objects has taught everyone, everyone, the powerful advantages of digital information. Many of our users had made that migration already. Now they all have emphatically. The future of print and how we cherish it is a challenge that librarians will take to thinking about naturally, but all is in fact changed. We've seen this before when digital music on CDs drove vinyl from the field. The irony that CDs are now disappearing and vinyl is reviving should not blind us to the fact that the space for vinyl is narrow, privileged, and constrained. And 99% of the music that participants in this call will listen to today on their earbuds or on their smart speakers is digital. Print is the equivalent of vinyl, digital is digital, or perhaps rather special collections, unique collections are the vinyl of our future and digital information is the commodity information. Main consequence of this flip is that the pressure to make everything our users want digitally available will ramp up dramatically. It's timely and appropriate that the debates over controlled digital lending have come to the fore in this moment. Peter Brantley gave a snapshot of the scrambles in California to figure out how to do that. However, the legal battles work out, the issue is with us to stay. It's 20 years at least since the visionary Greg Crane said that if it's not on the net, it's not information. The rights holders of legacy content need to recognize and act on the recognition that if it's not online, it's not literature because nobody's going to read it. The copyright log jam around 20th century copyright must break or the loss of audience for that content will be calamitous. Presentism is a powerful natural urge. Ah, why not just leave the last century behind? Librarians won't allow that. And business models around currently published content must evolve to allow ubiquitous universal access or the less accessible content will lose audience. My second point, the age of collecting is over. Nobody, not a single one of our users cares who owns content or owns the license to it. They care about getting access to it more or less instantaneously. Work and Dempsey of OCLC has been for some years now the prophet of what he calls the facilitated collection. What's effectively a comprehensive national collection of library materials, universally accessible, whatever the facts of ownership might be. Taking that collection global will be another giant but second step. This challenges libraries to do our business of resource sharing, cooperative collection development and strategic licensing better than we ever have before. And will challenge content providers to recognize the end state of enabling universal access is their only strategic option. Last point, the age of fumbling to remember your password needs to end very soon. David Weinberger's provocative description of a library-sized hole in the internet is now half a decade old, and the hole is getting bigger. About the time he launched that concept, we also began to get to know about two-factor authentication, an extra layer of futzing and fussing slowing our path to our resources. And if polite middle-aged librarians find that process annoying, we need to ask just how well we are inspiring and training 19-year-olds to persist in acquiring and practicing and caring about practicing the skills of this weird hunter-gatherer culture we have created. Libraries and our technology organization partners need to collaborate afresh on ways to make one-click access to resources for our users possible. Of course, full open access to information is a part of the solution, but the promised land of universal openness recedes beyond the horizon as vendors compete to continue to produce new and genuinely useful and important tools and resources that we will be challenged to pay for. We will not escape forever from the grubby world of commerce, but we need to make the transactions and constraints as invisible and unobstructive as we possibly can. There is, I believe, on these three territories, a promised land for us to claim. Digital information, ubiquitously and transparently available, 
with the librarian skills focused on guiding users through the intellectual, not just the technological challenges of what they need, finding what they need. To reach that promised land, I hope we don't face another 40 years in the desert of digitization, negotiation, and technological innovation. But for whatever that struggle remains, our commitment to reaching that promised land for benefit of our users is essential to the success, not merely of libraries, but of the communities whose very lives, as we were reminded this year, depend on the creation, dissemination, and accessibility of the work of scientists, scholars, and artists. Librarians' role in leading us out all from that desert remains essential. And thanks. Okay, well, uh, it's all digital. All right. Uh, you know, I'm really sorry we didn't have enough time to have a group discussion. I do want to thank all of our presenters. You were all special and extraordinary, uh, airport or no airport. I want to, before Leah takes over and bids us farewell, just identify a, a, a list of, of key things I heard, I think in the last hour and a half. Uh, one of the themes was that we are intensifying and trying to do better what we have been doing all along in order to improve the environment for our users and our community. That, that came through pretty strongly. Uh, there was a lot of foreground and background about virtuality versus physicality, which is better when, what privileges whom, or does it, how do we balance? Um, a third theme that I heard was, are we really encouraging diversity? Is that one of our goals in whatever the new normal is going to be, if there even ever is a new normal? Um, another one, another theme I heard from not hearing it was that nobody imagines technology as solving all these problems, but it's a very, very strong background desideratum need being wisely applied in many places. It's not the solution, but we depend on it. Um, another thing that I heard was that nobody, um, well, nobody was concerned about the continuation of their own institutions or neighboring institutions, except for our president, Rob Manuel, who had deep concerns about the continuation of anything in a form we have known it. And the final thing I think we heard that is that we don't know what the new normal will be yet, if we ever do, but there was a high degree of optimism about all of this, especially I think from, from Nancy. So uh, with those things in mind, uh, I'd say thank you again, and I'm going to hand over to Leah, who is our boss. Thank you, Anne. Um... Let's see here, share my final little slides here of thank you. Um, I would like to again echo Anne's thanks to all of our fantastic uh, panelists, uh, especially to Anne and to Roger as moderators. Um, it, we had a, a bit of a bumpy start <laughs> this morning with some technical glitches and everyone handled that uh, very, very well with a lot of grace and understanding. So I do thank you um, for that. I would also like to acknowledge uh, support from Adam Matthew for just a portion of the back end production costs that allowed us to keep registration costs low for our attendees, especially through that group rate registration that was very popular. Um, so thank you for that. And most of all, thank you to all of our attendees. Um, we are so glad that you're here for our inaugural Charleston uh, in between many conference event. Uh, I would ask that you please complete, we have a very brief survey that's gonna pop up as soon as I close the webinar. It's like 10 questions and it will greatly help us if you'll share your feedback uh, when we're planning for future events. Um, and also our recording will be emailed to uh, all attendees um, on Friday. So we're going to cut the, um, the recording into the morning panel and the afternoon panel. We'll remove the, <laughs> the little glitch at the beginning there and send out a fresh shiny recording to all of our attendees um, on Friday. 
So please uh, let me know if you have any questions in the meantime. And we hope to see you at the 2021 Charleston Conference this November, the November 1st through the 5th. Thank you very much and have a great day.